Really, that's just the center of the Christian life, is our want and our desire to be centered and focused around him. Amen. While you're still standing, and for those who are not standing, would you please stand for the reading of the Word of God? I'd like to draw your attention very quickly to the book of Galatians chapter 5. Galatians chapter 5, and beginning with verse number 22. I know we just had a a 15-minute praise break or maybe a 15-minute older, little early older session. But how many still hungry for the Word of God? Amen. Amen. How many still hungry for the move of God? Amen. 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 That's the great thing about the presence of God is that, is that it just lingers as long as you want to linger. It doesn't, it's not in a hurry like, like, brother, like brother Razor said last Sunday. Don't be in a hurry. And I'm so thankful that our song leader, I'm so thankful that our worship leader was not in a hurry, but rather just waited for God's timing. Amen. Amen. Galatians chapter 5 and beginning with verse 22. But the fruits of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, temperance. Against such there is no law. And they that are Christ have crucified the flesh with the affections and lusts. If we live in the Spirit, let us also walk in the Spirit. Let us not be desirous of vain glory, provoking one another, envying one another. If I could, I'd like to draw your attention back to verse 22, just the the first, first few right there. But the fruit of the Spirit is love and joy. Amen. I'd like to speak to you just for the next few moments from this title, The Two Sides of Joy. Amen. The two sides of joy. Would you place your Bibles down and lift your hands one more time towards heaven. Lord, we love you, God. Now, I'm pretty sure, at least uh, I, I, I hope that, uh, that everybody last week was aware that last week was Valentine's Day. At least I hope all the men in the house knew that last week was Valentine's Day. If, if you somehow might have forgotten last week was Valentine's Day, that might be the explanation for the reaction that you might or might not have received or the cold shoulder that you might have received last week. But, but if you could sum up Valentine's Day just in one word, traditionally, most likely, that word would be love. Everywhere you go, stores were decorated in red and pink. Hallmark sales were soaring. Candy, candy looked different. I love M&M's. But but even my M&M's look different. Skittles look different. Everything looked different. Praise God for candy. (laughs) Everything looked different, all with the hopes of creating an atmosphere of love. Just a few months ago, we we ended the Christmas season. And if, if you could sum up Christmas just in one word normally, that word would be joy. And really, if you think about it, Christmas really is a joyous time of the year. We, we celebrate the birth of our king, him leaving the splendors of heaven behind to save a world destined for damnation. Christmas can certainly be centered around that one word of joy. Growing up, I thought I knew the meaning of what joy was. Growing up, I, 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 thought, I, had, I thought I knew everything, but, but I, I certainly thought I knew what joy was. I remember getting on a roller coaster for the very first time and, and being someone that's not exactly very fond of heights. I remember sitting down in that seat and as they, they click that bar across your legs, I really don't know what that bar does because really in any event that you're going to be in, that bar is not going to do anything for you. <laughs> I remember going all the way to the top of the very first hill and looking down at the ground and seeing grown people walking around about the size of ants. And I remember white knuckling that bar that was right in front of me. And I can, I, can, I can remember being so thankful when the ride was over. As I got off, the, as I got off that ride shaking, I, I got off the blue and red racers. Yes, the, the blue and red racers. The death-defying blue and red racers that go a whopping 40 feet in the air tops. But as I was back down on the ground again, I thought I knew what joy was, thanking God that I was back on the ground. I remember playing Little League Baseball. How many played Little League Baseball? Okay, three people. Three people are going to heaven. Little League Baseball. (laughs) I remember playing Little League Baseball and going undefeated the entire year. And I remember at the end of the year bringing home the biggest trophy that I had at the time. And I remember sitting it on my shelf and just standing back and looking at it and thinking to myself, I knew exactly what joy was. 
until the very next year that I played, we, we, we went winless the entire year. <laughs> I knew what defeat was. <laughs> About 12 times I knew what defeat was. And, and I remember bringing home the, the participation trophy that was literally bigger than the first place trophy I had previously brought home. At that point, I knew what disappointment was. <laughs> I thought I knew what joy was, all my gamers, the very first time that I beat Super Mario Brothers for the very first time. I thought I knew what joy was the first time I ever had stuffed crust pizza. Can I get a witness? I thought I knew what joy was as a young person, and as, as a child I thought I knew what joy was, but, but as a preacher told me one time, the only thing I knew in those moments was happiness, because happiness is based off of the happenings of life, but joy is a fruit of the Spirit, and joy is something only God can give. It was joy the day I spoke in tongues for the very first time. It was joy the day I went down in the watery grave of baptism in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of my sins. Sins. It was joy the day I got a phone call that my baby girl received the Holy Ghost at Junior Bible Quizzing Extravaganza. I experience joy every time these altars are lined with our kids kneeling in prayer, wanting and desiring more of God. Amen. You see, that no matter what goes on in this world, this world can always touch your happiness, but this world can never touch your joy because only God can give you that joy. That's something only God can give, and that's something the world can't touch. That's something the world can't take. I'm thankful for every dance that we have during our praise breaks like we just had, and, and for every shout and for every tear, every, every cry, every lap that we do around this sanctuary. I'm thankful for our differences and how each of us experience and show our joy in different ways. Joy, by definition, is a feeling of great pleasure and satisfaction. Synonymous with tears of joy, jubilation, exaltation, and triumph. In the Old Testament, they had many times of rejoicing over the birth of children. They had many times of rejoicing over marriages. They had many times of rejoicing over the time of harvest. And they had times of rejoicing over military victories. And really, when you think about it, that's the side of joy that we're okay with, church. We can get excited over the birth of a child. We can get excited over a raise in our income. We can get excited over victories and miracles. And we can get excited over the union that, that, that God has brought together. That's the side of joy that we can, that we can literally shut down a, 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 a praise service. We can shut down a sermon early and tell the piano player to fire up the piano and tell the, tell the song singers to get their best song together. And we can pack out an altar and we can have a move of God. And there's nothing wrong with that. But that's the side of joy that we're okay with. Because that's the side of joy we're comfortable with. But there's another side of joy. There's another side of joy that, that we're very familiar with, but a little less excited about. You Bible quizzers know exactly what I'm talking about. In James chapter 1, verse 2. My brother encountered all joy when you fall into diverse temptations. Knowing this, that the trying of your faith worketh patience. But let patience have her perfect work, that you may be perfect and entire, wanting nothing. In other words, count it all joy when you feel like your back's against the wall. Right. Count it all joy when you feel like you've lost your mind and you feel like you lost your peace. Right. Count it all joy when you feel like God's your only option. Yeah. Count it all joy when you lost your job. Yeah. Count it all joy when you can't pay your bills. Count it all joy when you feel like they're talking about you behind your back. Yeah. Count it all joy when you simply just don't know what to do. Why? Because the trying of your faith worketh patience. And let patience have her perfect work, that you may be perfect and entire, wanting nothing. Many times that we ask God for answers. We bring prayers, we bring requests to God, and we, we, bring, we bring questions to God, and we, we desire an answer from God. And sometimes we don't like or sometimes we don't agree with that answer. But it's those moments that my flesh needs to understand that a no from God is better than any yes from my flesh. A no from Him is better than any yes from us. You see, there's so many stipulations and there's so many limitations that we feel like that we put on God and we call it our desires. But, but really all that is is just our, it's a box we put ourselves in. And that box is called our comfort zone. We pray for revival. We pray for God to move. We pray for God to shake us. But only if it's convenient. Only if it's comfortable. 
and certainly only if it's what we call joyous. My point is that we're all experiencing trials in our personal lives. Trials that have the ability not just to wear on us, but trials that have the ability to deflate us, to literally take the wind right out of us to the point that we feel that we're unrecognizable to our church friends or even ourselves. But church, the reason for your trial is not to take something out of you, but rather to put something into you. The purpose of your trial is not to defeat you, church, but the purpose of your trial is to complete you, to make you complete, to make you whole, to make you entire. The Bible says to make you perfect, wanting nothing. During Job's trial, covered from head to toe with boils, taking broken pots and scraping his skin just in hopes of trying to get some form of relief and standing over the graves of his ten children. I don't think that, that Job sat there and said to himself, man, this is great. I sure wish every day would be like this. That's not what the Bible says when it says counter all joy. But I believe Job stood there over those graves of his children. I believe Job being sick to the point of death, and I think that he looked at God and said, God, I don't understand it. And God, I certainly don't agree with it. But God, I trust that you're still in control. God, I trust that you haven't forgotten about me. God, I trust that you're giving me an expectant end. God, I trust that you're still in control of my life. You see, Job knew that a true dependency on God and that true joy was a, was a true dependency, rather, that he had on God, the friend who never left him during the middle or all through the, the darkest trials of his life. You see, there's two sides of joy, church. And both are equally important. Both are needed. Both are equally important. I have a friend of mine by the name of Brian Davis. He's a member of Grove City Church of the Nazarene. And I, I met him a few years ago when, when the youth division started using Grove City Nazarene for midwinter youth retreat. And he was, he was talking to me and he said, he said, following midwinter the first time that you guys had it there. He said, he said, members of our congregation that was working this event, he said they were blown away at, at, at just how the young people responded to the presence of God, about, about how the young people packed the altars and, and, and just free with their worship. He said, he's, he said that many remarked at the end of our conference that there was something like a haze just hanging over the sanctuary. He said that many members that were, that were working that event began to seek after what our young people have. And it was reported shortly after midwinter, the first time we had it there, that many members of Grove City Nazarene received the baptism of the Holy Ghost. Amen. That's right. Clap. Thank God for what he's doing. It's not reserved for just us, but it's for whosoever will. I began to, 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 to continue to talk to Brian throughout the years. And, and every single year, as midwinter, we get closer, we would talk again. And he would tell me what, what God was doing in their local church. And he told me of what God was doing in Grove City. But recently, I was, I was informed that Brian has been diagnosed with stage 4 cancer. And uh, I saw him just the day before midwinter this year. Brian's lost his hair. He's lost roughly about 40 pounds now, and a lot about Brian's changed. But you see, Brian was a small groups leader of his church. Brian would organize the men's to get together, and he would, he would organize the men's Bible studies. He would, he would organize these things because he was a small groups leader. And you see, so much about Brian's changed. He's lost his hair, and he's, he's lost some of his weight. But Brian still has not lost his purpose. You see, Brian has started a new small group. And he's trying to reach those that he's taking chemotherapy with every single week. God might have allowed change to happen in his health for just a moment. But now Brian has the perfect opportunity. He has the perfect in route to reach an entire field of souls that only Brian can reach. Church, we sing that song at every single one of our, uh, at, at every single one of our conferences and every single one of our youth camps. I surrender all to you, withholding nothing, withholding nothing. But church, I ask you this morning, what stipulations are we putting on God? I'm not saying that we should foolishly pray for illness. I'm not saying that we should, pull, that, that, that we should foolishly pray for calamity. But what I'm saying is, what if that's God's way to use you? What if that's God's en route 
for you to reach an entire harvest of souls. I know it sounds crazy. I know it sounds extreme. But the point is don't put limitations. Don't put stipulations on God. We pray for revival. We pray for miracles. We pray for mighty victory. We pray for a harvest of souls. We pray for baptisms like we had last week. And, and I thank God for two that were baptized and three that were filled with the Holy Ghost. But what stipulations are we putting on God? God, give us all those things, but only if it's convenient. Only if I only have to pray a half hour every day. God, help us. Only if it's convenient. Only if it's joyous. Only if it's comfortable. I went over to, uh, to Great Clips yesterday, and they, they, they made short work of me. <laughs> but I was sitting in the chair, and, and a lady, she began to, she began to, to, to just talk to me. And I, I, said, uh, I said, do you have any kids? And she said, yeah. She said, I have a 16-year-old. And I said, oh, wow. I said, that's the, that's the exciting time right there. I said, I said, I've been involved in youth ministry for 14 years. I said, 16 is a very fun age. And uh, I couldn't tell whether, whether she had a cold. I, I couldn't tell whether, whether, she was, whether she was touched or whether she was crying. I, I couldn't tell. I had my glasses off, and I'm blind as a bat without my glasses. And she, she, she began to tell me about her 16-year-old daughter who's had 19 surgeries in her 16 years. She's, she's had several complications with her trachea, and she's, she said her head is half the size of what it should be. She said her daughter just, just went on her first date at the age of 16, and the comment that her daughter said was, I just want to be normal like every other kid. I want to experience life like every other kid. Church, while she began to, while she began to, to tell me those things, I couldn't help but realize she was wiping her eyes. I couldn't help but realize that, that, that she, was, she was sniffling a lot. I couldn't help but realize all those things. But church, so many times we, 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 say, we look at situations like that and we say, God, don't ever let that happen to me. And, and there's nothing wrong with being a parent that's protective of your kids. I pray protection of my kids every single day, Brother West. I pray, God, keep your hands upon my kids. But what, what if that's what God wants to use? What if God wants to take something, something that, 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 that everyone would look at as being a handicap? And what, what if God wants to take something, something like that? But that's going to open up a door for, for thousands, for hundreds. What stipulations are we putting on God, church? As you'd stand and as we're drawing to a close this afternoon, I'm calling every single one of us to a time of self-examination. Oh, we love to sing that song, I feel the joy of the Lord falling fresh on me. We love to jump, we love to shout, we love to dance, we love to do laps of Jericho. But what about the other side of joy? What about the other side of joy that says, I'm going to take you from up here and I'm, I'm going to put you down here just so you can reach that one over there? What about the other side of joy that says, I know you're comfortable over here and you know everybody. I'm going to move you all the way over here where you don't know anybody because I'm going to raise up a harvest of souls. Amen. What about the other side of joy that says, I'm going to allow my name to be glorified through a trial that everyone's going to see in your life publicly? What about the other side of joy, church? I'm inviting everyone under the sound of my voice to come to these altars today and to take the stipulations off of God, to take the limitations off of ourselves and hold nothing back. Oh, we love to sing that song. I surrender all to you, withholding nothing, withholding nothing. But let it be more than just a song. Let it be more than just a prayer. Let it be a commitment. Don't let it just be a moment that passes by. Oh, we can get excited and we can jump and shout when the rhythm's fast. And we can jump and we can shout when everyone's moving and, and when everyone's jumping. I invite us all to come. Let's have a move of God when we take the stipulations and the limitations off. And let's hold nothing back. Let's all come and let's gather in.